welcome you all on behalf of uh, Peace Agency to New York to uh, the official book launch of uh, this great book by uh, Fred Constein, who's a professor at uh, Rice University uh, at the Sociology Department. Uh, this is the book. Uh, we'll also place links uh, in the uh, chat sec uh, section there. It's called The Humanity of Muhammad, A Christian View. Uh, so welcome, Craig, uh, to the event uh, today, to the book launch. Thank you for being patient with us as we uh, uh, strive to get through those technical issues. Uh, maybe we can start, before we start talking about your, your, your book, maybe we can give a, a bit of introduction to how you came across uh, Islam, Muslims, what, what drove that initial curiosity? Sure. So thank you so much, Emre, and thank you to the Peace Islands Institute um, for hosting this event. And thank you all, uh, wherever you are, whether you're in the U.S. or around the world, for joining this session tonight. So the first chapter of the book actually um, dives right into my own kind of personal backdrop and how this journey of mine started. And whether I knew it at the time or not, this journey really started on September 11th. I was 16 years old. I was a junior in high school. And, you know, I don't need to relive the details of that day. Everyone knows what happened. But long story short, I remember leaving my classroom on that day. And, you know, you start hearing all of these um, chants, these patriotic tunes that a lot of Americans are familiar with, you know, USA, USA. And I was also hearing some pretty derogatory comments about the, um, the identities of the alleged attacker. So people were talking about Islam and Muslims. And, you know, as a young man at the time, I really had absolutely no context to make sense of what had just transpired. And and also the events that transpired after 9-11. So the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, I had no context. So I had met no Muslims prior to 9-11. I had never been to a mosque. The town I grew up in was 98% white and 98% Christian. So I had no context. When it came time to decide what I wanted to study in college, the Iraq war was unfolding. The Afghanistan war was in its second year. And I wanted to figure out why all of this was happening and largely went into my studies with this perception that the Islamic tradition was in a clash of civilizations with my own country, the United States. And I started enrolling in various classes. I was taking Arabic. I was taking, you know, Islam 101 classes. And Thankfully, I came across Professor Akbar Ahmed, the Ibn Khaldun Chair um, of Islamic Studies at American University. And one of the first things Professor Ahmed told the class on the, uh, the very first day of our gathering, he was emphasizing the uh, importance of learning and knowledge and dialogue rooted in the Islamic tradition, starting with Prophet Muhammad. And for me, some of the hadiths that uh, Professor Ahmed was sharing really kind of rocked me to my core. And one in particular was the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. I'll repeat that. The ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. And that hadith, as well as Professor Ahmed's guidance in my life, really kind of shook me to my core. It obviously significantly impacted what I thought about this subject that I was studying, but it also kind of shook me as a person of faith and also as someone who um, is a citizen of the United States. So I became passionate in what Professor Ahmed was teaching us, the importance of interfaith dialogue, the importance of not only being rigorous in studies like engaging with books and peer reviewed journal articles, but also gaining knowledge through interacting with my fellow human beings. So I went on a, a journey with him around my own country. Um, we traveled for a year, we went to over 100 mosques. And this project was titled Journey into America, the challenge of Islam. It also, uh, that's the title of the book. And we also produced a documentary 
called Journey into America, which I directed, and that's available on YouTube. And from there, it really just kind of catapulted me um, as, a, as a young man, as a person of faith, as a young professional. Um, I've basically been engaged in interfaith studies, um, engaging with the Islamic tradition um, since I walked into his classroom. And my own kind of relationship with um, Muhammad, who has been the focus of my studies in recent years, really began when I was a doctoral student at Trinity College in, in Dublin, Ireland, and I came across John Andrew Morrow, another role model and, and guide of mine, who produced and published the book, The Covenants of Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of His Time. And for me, that book opened up a whole new realm of knowledge, uh, largely Muhammad's interactions with Christians. And that's what the book is really about. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Craig, for your uh, introduction. I, I should add as, a, as an important note, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing uh, Professor uh, Akbar Ahmed. Uh, he's, he's invited me to speak to his class. Uh, he's yes. a wonderful individual. He great. He's, uh, he's literally ambassador, but he's a, he's a great ambassador uh, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, American Muslims and, and really for, for Islam. Now, in your book, uh, let's delve into that. You, uh, you've got six chapters, uh, very contemporary issues, religious pluralism, civic nation state building, anti-racism, very contemporary, of course, seeking knowledge, women's rights, and uh, the golden rule. Maybe you can break these up. What what are the pertinent points that you you cover there, and really why? Why did you, in particular, pick these uh, uh, particular uh, themes? And and what what would Americans or really Westerns gain from from reading this book in particular these these areas? So thank you for that, Emery. Um, definitely the pertinence and the timeliness. Um, was on my mind when I was crafting these chapters. I, as a academic, but also as um, a public intellectual, I really try quite hard to bring some of these historical moments and to relate them to our current times and to present them in a way that, are, that is easily digestible. And I like to also put sociological uh, spins and I like to approach some of these historical um, moments in time um, with sociological concepts. And this is something that not a lot of scholars have necessarily done, especially as it pertains to uh, Muhammad's life and legacy. We often kind of, as academics, you may approach his life through a religious context or a prophetic context or a Islamic theological context, but I kind of wanted to look at him more in terms of his um, relations with other people. So the three, the first three chapters, I think are probably most pertinent to um, things that are unfolding around us today. I'm actually gonna start with the third chapter, which is um, anti-racism. So obviously this term anti-racism is something that we have seen actually pop up in mainstream media over the last couple months due largely to the, um, it started with the passing of George Floyd and then obviously all of the um, ramifications that have come out of that. The, um, the mainstream emergence of Black Lives Matter. And we see a lot of people who are directly impacted by the, um, the structural um, injustices that we see in this country. They're saying to all of us that it's not enough anymore to be merely non-racist. They're actually saying you need to be anti-racist. There's a very distinct difference between these two concepts. To be a non-racist is simply to be a person that does not believe in racial superiority. But when we approach the term anti-racist, it's assuming that an individual does not hold views in accordance to racial superiority, but it's also uh, signifying action, that people are actually putting forth energy and effort to dismantle racism. And we know through the historical sources that being anti-racist was something on Prophet Muhammad's mind as an individual, but it was also 
a fundamental component of his vision for the Ummah, for his nation. And we can view Muhammad's views on anti-racism through two main things which I address in the book. One is the relationship that he forged with Bilal ibn Rabah. So for those who may not be familiar with Bilal ibn Rabah, he was a, a black man, half black, half Arab. Um, his mother is said to have been a princess from Abyssinia and his father was um, probably a local Meccan. And Bilal was born into slavery and he became a close companion of Muhammad. He was one of the early followers of the monotheistic message that Muhammad was giving to the people of Mecca. We know that Muhammad and another of his companions, uh, Abu Bakr, wor uh, worked to free Bilal from his enslaved position. We know that Muhammad used to um, almost interrupt other companions who were putting Bilal down, saying that he was the son of a black woman. We know Muhammad would, would come in and say, hey, this idea of judging people by how they look is not part of you know, my vision. And we know that Muhammad even referred to this companion who was believing in racial superiority. He was saying, you are stuck in the age of Jahaliya, the state of ignorance. And this is really important because what Muhammad is saying here is this idea of being a racist is not only ignorant, but it's also not part of the vision of the Ummah. And then we know that Bilal ends up being raised up into the position of a muezzin and holds a prominent position uh, in the early Muslim community. We also see, as I address in the book, Muhammad's anti-racist views popping up in the farewell sermon presented in 632, one of Muhammad's last addresses to the uh, large body of following that he had. And I'll paraphrase essentially what he was saying, but he was saying an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, a white person has no superiority over a black person, and a black person has no superiority over a white person except in piety and good action, right? Except in piety and good action. Now, I personally love this quote because I grew up uh, in Boston as a Christian, as an American with... I grew up with great reverence for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we know in 1963 in his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King said something quite similar to what Muhammad was saying. Dr. King said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, I hope that my children will one day grow up in a country that they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, right? So we see a, a kind of uh, a bridge here between this idea of Islamic civilization and, and Islam. And then we have a Christian who is an African-American and an American saying the same thing, except they're a thousand years apart. It's a beautiful, it's a, a beautiful bridge. So the anti-racist message that Muhammad had presented uh, in the seventh century is actually more timely than ever. And I've been spreading this message, um, not merely as a means of, you know, propping up Muhammad. That's not necessarily my motive. It's a genuine appreciation for a message that is needed. And you don't need to be a Muslim necessarily to digest the meaning and the importance of that message. Um, Emery, should I keep going and talking about other, other themes? Okay. So the, the, other, the other sociological concept I think that really sticks out in the book, uh, and again, I'm going to kind of play on a binary here, right? So we just addressed the difference between non-racism and, and anti-racism. The first, uh, the second chapter of the book outside, of, well, it's the first chapter. Um, it's called Religious Pluralism. And one of the major um, sociological developments in the last decade or so due largely to the work of a scholar named Diana Eck at Harvard University is this distinction between religious tolerance and religious pluralism. Religious tolerance, according to Professor Eck, is not sufficient enough for a hyper diverse society like ours here in the United States, and especially in New York City, where Peace Islands is based. Eck is saying that this idea of tolerance is very standoffish. 
it's not a bad thing, tolerance, but she's saying that, okay, it doesn't really push us and it doesn't encourage us to get to know one another. So think of it this way, tolerance, like if we were in a room and we were to tolerate each other and we divided ourselves up into categories and say there were four groups, each group went into the corner of their room and we were to tolerate each other. Each group could do whatever they wished and no one bothered one another. I suppose that's a good thing. That's tolerance. But Eck is saying that pluralism is something much different. Pluralism is the energetic engagement with religious diversity. So Eck is saying that this pluralism requires us to give effort. It requires us to enter into dialogue. It requires us to share the same spaces together. It requires us to work together on common projects. Let's say like uh, feeding the hungry or entering into a blood drive together. So she's saying, hey, what we need is a lot more human traffic. We need to actually interact with one another because in interacting with one another, you can really start developing human relationships, not necessarily interfaith relationships, but human relationships. And these human relationships help us build trust. Trust helps us build a friendship. And when you become friends with people, that is certainly healthy. And we know that Muhammad did not merely uh, tolerate uh, religious differences. And the example that the main example that I use in the book is his interaction with the Christians of Nadran. So around 630, Muhammad uh, was sending out various um, documents or letters to various rulers in the region, basically announcing who he was, what his mission was, and who his community, um, what the community stood for, this believers movement, the, the Uma, the, the monotheists. And the Christian community of Nadran, which is currently located in southern Saudi Arabia, close to the border of Yemen, it's an ancient Christian community that had been there for uh, probably since the beginning of the fourth century, so the early 300s. And the history, the historical sources tell us that the Christians of Nadran actually visited Muhammad and the believers, uh, the Ummah, in Medina, which is where the, the Ummah was located at the time. And the Christians and the Muslims had entered into a dialogue inside uh, the Prophet's mosque in Medina. And they engaged in various dialogues, trying to understand um, what each other and what each other's religious traditions were standing for. Again, not merely tolerating. We know Muhammad tolerated them because he invited them and he hosted them in, in, his, in his space. But they were really grappling. Uh, they were discussing. They were communicating. And they were trying to find ways of how can we make, how can we make this work? And they did it successfully. We know that they didn't see eye to eye on all matters, especially around the divinity of Jesus. But we know that the meeting was cordial. And the beauty of the story is when it came time for the Christians of Nadran to go pray, they, the leaders started leaving the masjid, the mosque, and Muhammad actually requested that they return inside into the mosque and to use that space as a means to pray. So essentially, Muhammad was inviting them uh, to engage in a, a ritual, a sacred ritual inside a, a quote unquote Islamic space. Now that I think is a lot more than mere tolerance. It's actually putting forth that extra effort to make people feel comfortable, to make people feel safe. When you show that level of hospitality to a community that were essentially made up of a bunch of strangers, you really increase the chances of creating a bond with people. And we also see, and this is the last point, and then I'll throw it back to you, Imre. Um, we also see pluralism through Muhammad's interactions with um, the various polytheistic tribes and the Jewish tribes when the uh, second Hijra occurred when the Muslim community, as many of you who are listening know, um, in 622, Muhammad migrates to Medina. Um, he is basically a, a 
a mediator to try to resolve various local conflicts between the polytheistic, uh, the tribes and the Jewish tribes. And Muhammad was engaging with them in a very energetic way. He was saying, you know, let's all come together. Uh, let's hear each other's grievances and let's try to find a way of communicating in a manner that is constructive and productive to all of us. So we see the pluralism there, but more importantly, and this is where chapter two of the book comes in, Muhammad and the, the Jewish tribes and the polytheistic tribes create the constitution of Medina, which is really not too dissimilar to the United States constitution. And I call this, and I refer to it in the book as a civic nation, a civic nation, ideally is what the United States is. And when you look at the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, it really doesn't put any uh, requirements in terms of race, religion, ethnicity. It doesn't say you need to look this way, you need to believe this, or you need to be part of this religion. The Constitution doesn't say that. The Constitution is open, right? It's, it's almost like an, it's an open contract. As long as you believe in these egalitarian democratic ideals, you can be whoever you want, right? So you're, a person's sense of belonging in Medina as part of this wider nation that Muhammad was trying to create really moved away from this idea that you had to be a certain religion. Um, the constitution of Medina provided freedom of religion. It provided freedom of conscience provided freedom of speech, private property, uh, private property rights. And essentially what it was doing, it was creating a community that was mutually dependent upon one another, as I hope we are in this country, the United States, basically saying, if a problem affects the Jewish tribes, it's also going to affect the Muslims and it's also gonna affect the, the other tribes. So we're all in this together, essentially is what he was saying. And I think that's a really, Another, it's another really important bridge. Like when, when we hear this theory of the clash of civilizations, like Islamic civilization and, and Western civilization are somehow fundamentally incompatible, we can just turn to two very simple things, the Constitution of Medina and the Constitution of the United States. They're not identical, obviously, but at its root, at its core, and the foundation of these two documents are very, very uh, similar. And I think this country in particular, at this point, we need more religious pluralism. We need to have a stronger sense of what it means to be an American in terms of our laws and our values. And of course, the anti-racism. I think these are really three pertinent sociological concepts um, that come out in this book. Is that Thank a, you. There's a lot there, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Craig, for, for that. I, I wanted to touch on, and, and, and you've basically uh, brought that up, the, the, the issue of U.S. founding fathers, American values, is Islamic values. Uh, what, what, are, what are the few things you, you'd want Americans to, to know more about Islam in terms of shared values? And, and really, as a kind of a juxtaposed to that is, how, how is Muhammad and Jesus, who are both prophets in Islam, and we say peace be upon them, uh, as, as, as Muslims, what are their similarities? What should Americans know uh, within the reference of, of Jesus, who, who Muhammad was? What, what makes them similar? Those are two really good questions um, that probably deserve, each question probably deserves its own, its own session. But so what I would like Americans to know um, about, you know, the Islamic tradition and Muhammad in particular, that's a tough question just because we're so diverse. You know, a part of me wants to approach it through the lens of, of monotheism, you know? So like what can evangelical Christians learn about Islam or, or Prophet Muhammad? Um, I think, you know, to be honest, the three examples that I gave are, are really pertinent at this point in time. Um, I, I think too often, um, a lot of Americans see Islam as something that is, is too foreign, that it's just not familiar uh, to a lot of people. And Jews and Christians in particular need to recognize that 
you know, Islam did not come out of nowhere. It's a continuation of a religious tradition that is monotheist. And, you know, the more I study, the more I read about uh, Christianity, especially early Christianity and, and Islam. Uh, and of course, um, you know, neither one of these traditions could exist without Judaism. The more I really see uh, these three entities being part of a, it's like a single tree and they're all just, they all have their own branch on the same tree, but really that they're one. And I think it's increasingly important for Jews, Christians, and Muslims in this country to recognize each other as being part of the, the same shared monotheistic tradition that is rooted in the Bible, that is rooted in Abraham. I think this is increasingly important, and especially though for, for Christians. Um, I, I think most of what Christians hear about the Islamic tradition and Muhammad is, is fed through, you know, obviously the news and, and social media, but it's not really rooted in the vision of, of Islam and Muhammad that most Muslims have. And I think most Muslims in this country, and again, I don't want to paint too wide of a brush, but when, from what I've heard in my interactions, you know, Islamic values like, uh, like justice, um, peace, uh, tolerance, charity, you know, as a Christian, these are the four things, four of, uh, four of the most important things that are kind of the basis of my own faith. And that's why I feel so connected to uh, the Islamic tradition, because I see so many Muslims also embodying these principles in their own faith. So I think, you know, Christians, it's not necessarily upon Muslims to, to teach Christians about these things. I think that's where someone like I can come in and, and show a side of the Islamic tradition that is not seen in, in the mainstream. In terms of Jesus and Muhammad, I think the the, the principles that I just outlined, you know, uh, justice, uh, peace, tolerance, charity. Um, when you think, when I was growing up, those were the some of the themes that we were taught um, about Jesus. And then when I started studying Muhammad, I'm starting to see it's it's a reflection that these two individuals are are really uh, standing for similar values. And the, the last chapter of the book actually touches upon uh, the golden rule, which is to, to treat others how you wish to be treated. And we know Jesus in his uh, Sermon on the Mount, he was echoing this message, you know, love one another, love, love your neighbor, uh, don't mistreat people. And I think, you know, when I think of Jesus and Muhammad too, those were those points I just raised are very kind of macro um, societal issues. But I think when you really dig into their life and legacy, it was how they treated common people and how they treated people on an everyday basis. So one of my favorite stories about Muhammad that I, I hope a lot of people who follow Jesus would be able to resonate with is um, when a Jewish funeral procession was passing Muhammad and some of his companions who were sitting down on the street and a, the funeral procession walks by and, and Muhammad stood up uh, out of respect. And one of the companions said, what are you doing? This, you know, this is a Jewish funeral procession. Why would you stand for that? And then Muhammad kind of turned to him and said, is it not a human soul? Is this, is this not a, a human being who has a family, who has loved ones, uh, and who is loved? I mean, when I think of examples like that, I think about Jesus' spirit, what he stood for. You know, too often we get hung up, especially sometimes in interfaith discussions, like we get so hung up on something like the Trinity, right, or, or Jesus' divinity, but when you think about his message and what he was trying to do, he was trying to get the people who have been left behind by the leaders, many of which, if you believe in the historical records, were corrupt, right? 
Jesus, we often forget, was hanging out with beggar, beggar, beggars, beggars. He was hanging out with uh, prostitutes. He was bringing these people that no one else would hang out with and said, I love you. I can, I can help you. And I think Muhammad was doing something similar. When, what he did with Bilal, no one wanted to go near Bilal. No one wanted to befriend Bilal. We also know Muhammad emphasized the importance of taking care of orphans, of raising the status of women, right? So it's how they treated just basic people on an everyday basis, treating them with dignity, with respect, and ultimately trying to remind all of us that we're all part of the, the same creation. We're all human beings. Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone watching, uh, we're taking questions uh, from the right-hand side of, of the YouTube channel. Of course, while you're here, please do subscribe to our channel and support this video by giving a thumbs, like, uh, thumbs up. We've also shared a link to uh, Craig's book, a uh, link to Amazon. So uh, if you haven't already had a chance, please do so. I believe it's it's uh, number one already in its category. So well done on, in that regards, uh, Craig. Now, of course, a lot of your messaging is towards people that are outside of Islam to uh, to the broader wider American community, to Christians, to non-believers, uh, you know, uh, the wider uh, community. And w what about in regards to your interactions with Muslims? And because you're someone on the outside, somewhat looking in, uh, is there any advice you give them? Because we have the theory in regards to uh, what Islam is, what the Quran tells us, what the Prophet tells us. But what are Muslims getting wrong? Are you in a position to be able to uh, give some sound advice? What can, particularly in the West, because there is, you know, there's various periods of antagonism. We have various unfortunate incidents. It's it's painted as if this is Islam. These are all all, all Muslims are, are like these Muslims, etc. Are there lessons for, for Muslims in regards to how they can uh, espouse these values? The theory is great, but uh, are Muslims getting something wrong? Well, you know, it's an important subject. And I think the first thing I'd like to kind of say is that, you know, Islam, Muslims, America, the West, none of these things are, are, are monoliths, you know? Um, and we need to recognize that there's so much diversity. There's so many differing opinions, um, different perspectives on how to approach living in a secular society like the United States. And, you know, for a lot of uh, Muslim migrants that maybe have, have come to America 10 years ago and they, they come to a society in which, you know, in the public sphere, religion is not a big deal. You know, that's difficult for some people to kind of digest and to, to kind of uh, make sense of. But I think my advice to, to people that may be kind of struggling with, you know, living in a secular society, I would recommend that they go, uh, not, not pick up my book, I can't say that, but go back to Muhammad's life and legacy. And you could pretty much find all, uh, all different types of advice on how to, how to navigate um, various societal uh, challenges. You know, yes, Muhammad was a, a prophet. Yes, he was um, providing a theological message. Yes. But, you know, he was also a person of, of many different hats. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the Constitution of Medina, he was a statesman. Okay. He was a, a, essentially a diplomat. He was the leader of a community. And he was creating a community, as I mentioned, that I think is rooted in a civic nation. Right. So this idea of like democracy and liberal values and, and Western civilization to suggest that these three things are not Islamic. Uh, according to Muhammad's life and legacy, I would challenge that. And this goes back to the whole clash of civilizations thing. You know, Western civilization would not be where it is without um the immense contributions that Muslims have made throughout history. You know, this idea that these two entities are separate is just not, it's just not valid. Um, so I would say to some uh, Muslims, if I could give some very humble advice, and I could give the same advice to, to Christians uh, as well, 
um, go back into your history and to tr try and find moments in time that make sense in terms of your, your current surroundings. And I promise you, you'll be able to find examples that blend this idea of Western civilization and Islamic civilization together to the point where you don't necessarily see these two things as being separate, that they're actually part of a of the same civilization. And this is something that I'm actually writing in a new book. When we talk about Western civilization, we should include Islam in that and vice versa. You know, these two civilizations have always uh, worked with one another and, and bounced off one another and fed um, off of one another. So I think that would be, that's a very broad uh, piece of advice or a, a suggestion, you know, like I could get into um, in individual examples. Um, like I know one thing I'm often asked, um, especially among youth, Muslim youth in this country, um, who I've interacted with, who ask me about how to deal with um, Islamophobia. And I think what I'm about to say is also pertinent to any young person in this country. And it's actually rooted in something that um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf told me um, back in February of 2019. I spent a day with him out at Zaytuna and we weren't talking about Islamophobia. We were talking about transcending hardship and how we can do that without kind of burying our head in the sand. And he gave me a very simple example. He said, there's two ways of thinking about life. You can have horizontal thinking or you can have vertical thinking. The horizontal thinking is when a human being's mind is so immersed in, in this world with gossip and clicks uh, and the latest fashion and um, relationships with people and basically trying to please everyone, right? But the vertical thinking aligns us to our creator, however you want to define that. The creator is the, the ultimate uh, judge. He's the ultimate uh, giver of life. He's the source of everything. So when, when people are so caught up with what's happening around us, you know, haven't we lost sight of the real aim, which is, you know, the person who created us or the, the being that uh, created us. So I think that's another important recommendation. And that goes beyond recommendation for Muslims. I think it goes for all of us, myself included. I mean, I struggle, I struggle with that as well. You know, getting nasty messages on social media on a daily basis. You know, sometimes you're like, I want to respond to this, or maybe this person is right. Let's block out those things. I mean, think of uh, going back to the book, think about Muhammad. Think about all the hardships that this person went through, coming into the world basically as an orphan, having his family and his, his tribal members go against him, you know, having to migrate to a new city. You know, do you not think that this person was aligned vertically? Do you not think he trusted in that source just as Jesus trusted in that source? I mean, if he was caught up in the horizontal stuff, he never would have been successful ever. You know, like you, you have to just, you have to connect with that higher purpose. I think that that's good advice for all of us. I hope that's not too <laughs> philosophical. I don't know, but I think it's, I think it's, it's useful. I think. We should have you want to discuss some of these in more detail later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we need really uh, a session for each. Yeah. I, I'm not even going to uh, uh, bring up, uh, I think it was a chapter four, a chapter of women's rights. That's a, that's a whole session unto itself. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's critical. Yeah, and then uh, the, knowledge, the knowledge chapter is the longest, easily. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, th that's where I, I get into all the moments in history, again, where Christians and Muslims are not just tolerating each other. They're actually like working together and they're flourishing together. So I talk about Al-Andalus. I talk about the other Al-Andalus, which is uh, Sicily. A lot of people don't know that what happened in Muslim Spain, Al-Andalus, happened in Sicily. 
uh, with different groups of people, but you had uh, Greeks, Byzantine Christians, Normans, Arabs, uh, the Lombards, which were uh, a Germanic group, and uh, Muslims all coming together and creating together. Um, you know, and those those are the moments. You know, Emre, going back to your last question, you know, like um, what advice would you give to people? Go back and find these moments in history, which remind us of the synthesis of civilizations where these ideas of being Christian, being Muslim kind of dissolve into something that is more human. Mm -hmm. So it's not Islamic civilization or Western civilization, it's human civilization. Mm -hmm. And it's creating something that has never been seen before. And it's all rooted in, of course, tolerance, but it's, it's rooted in a love of, of knowledge. And we know Muhammad was a lover of knowledge too. It should almost, and on occasion, of course, there's arguments against it, but the one's faith, one's uh, race should almost be incidental. Exactly. Because you of know. our shared humanity. Of course, this is not to negate that and say these aren't important. Uh, there's a place for that, but that's not the first thing we should see. And unfortunately, it, it tends to be. Yeah, of course, we, we've seen videos of, of kids how they are colorblind, right? To yeah, children, they don't see those things, but unfortunately, uh, there's something missing as yeah. we supposedly mature, if you will, and, and those identities become the first thing we see as yeah. opposed to our, our humanness, our, our humanity. And can I add something to that real quick? Emma? Yes, like, please. you know, um. The whole identity politics thing, which is something that is kind of dominating our, our current national discourse, you know, like it's it's really important to recognize people for who they are, especially if they're visibly something, right? Like if they're wearing a yarmulke, like we we know that they're Jewish. We don't necessarily know what sect of Judaism they're following, but we know they're Jewish. And, you know, it's important to recognize that. It's important to be aware of it. But we are and I say this as a kind of nation at the moment, like we have this tendency of re judging a person by their body. As you judge a book by a cover, we judge a person by their body. And we come up with conclusions based on religious symbols, based on ethnicity and, and race and all this stuff. And I think there's, there's value in recognizing these things, but what I've been trying to encourage people to do, instead of using a, as a, a text, what if we started looking at people as this is a, a son, or this is a, this is a daughter, or this is a father, mother, or an employee, or something like this. You know, for, for me, I think that really levels it all down and it brings to a human level that I think is really important because then we can start thinking like, you know, every, every mother loves their child uh, and like things like that, like just get to the core of who we are rather than, um, you know, immediately jumping uh, to a stereotype and, and basing conclusions off of these stereotypes. It's hard to do, but I think there's value in it. Uh, yes. Yeah, now, uh, we've got a question from the audience. We've got a few. Uh, we have limited time, but we'll uh, take uh, as many questions as we can. I've noted them. So this is a question from William. And he asks, where do the concepts of Muhammad being antagonistic against Jews and Christians come from? Good question, William. Um, for groups, uh, if you go to the Quran, there are uh, passages and, you know, it would take forever to break this down automatically, but there are passages which basically uh, criticize um, Christians to going too far in, in their faith and uh, kind of veering away from a strict monotheism was uh, providing. So in the context of Christians, we know um, scripture says, you know, something like the Trinity is, is it, it's excessive. It's going too far that it kind of, it may be um, placing partners in the same light as God. So there are kind of theological, um, there are passages in the Quran that raise 
potential theological differences. I don't necessarily think they do. If you go back into history and kind of understand the context in which Muhammad was living and who the Christians were and who the Jews were around him. I mean, that's a story for another day, but you know, there are theological potential theological differences that create the, the divide with the Jewish community, as mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the civic nation, Muhammad enters the constitution of Medina, uh, various Jewish tribes had entered into the, the pact, um, whether there were Christians involved in the pact, that's kind of um, up for uh, debate and it's, it's speculated even to this day. Uh, but what ended up happening, uh, according to the sources, most historical sources, um, the Jewish community, uh, the Jewish tribes of Medina ended up uh, going into an alliance against Muhammad's uh, enemies in, in Mecca, uh, largely the Quraysh. Uh, which was Muhammad's tribe that had kind of turned their back on Muhammad. And from there, um, things fell apart. The constitution fell apart. Uh, with Christians at the time, uh, the Byzantine empire was uh, essentially a collapsing empire. Uh, Heracles was the main emperor. We're talking, you know, 620 to, to 630. Um, the Byzantines were fighting against the, the Persian Empire or the Sasanian Empire to the east in modern day uh, Iran. And these two empires were fighting all over the Arabian uh, Peninsula for power, for territory and for riches. And the Byzantines, the Christians were quite aggressive in some of their maneuvers and Muhammad and his, um, his army uh, decided to engage in several battles. Um, a lot of scholars would say defensive battles with these populations and, and they fought. But I think William, the main point here is this, um, these wars and the breakdown of the constitution of Medina, I think should be seen largely as a political issue rather than a, a, a fundamental theological difference. At the end of the day, the Quran places Jews and Christians in the position of al kitab people of the book. So basically saying that we're all part of the same tradition. But as I mentioned earlier, there are some verses that say some Christians and some Jews have gone to excessive realms and to excessive places with their, with their religion. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I hope you've got a, a few extra minutes because of our- Yeah, yeah, let's go. Um, is that okay? We yeah we, yeah uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Craig. We've got some more questions. Uh, earlier there, and this is from uh, Semanur. Earlier there was a question about what Christians should know about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. On the flip side, is there anything you think Muslims should understand better about Christianity and and Jesus? Good question. So personally, uh, one thing that I have found um, as a pattern perhaps a troubling pattern too, is um, some views that Muslims have about the, the Trinity. Um, so the, the Trinity, um, to, be, to be clear, has not always been uh, a, a theological concept that has been agreed upon by Christians throughout history. So the Council of Nicaea largely created the the Trinity as an official church doctrine in 325. So 325 years after Jesus's uh, passing. And up until that time, there were a lot of different Christian communities that had various ideas and beliefs about who Jesus was. But over time, you know, you had influential emperors like Constantine of, of Rome, ends up moving to Constantinople, creating the Byzantine Empire. These people were pushing for, for power. They were trying to consolidate power, and they largely uh, created concepts, something like um, the Trinity. Now, personally, when I see a message about the Trinity and someone is like, how can you believe in this? They automatically uh, assume that somehow the Trinity is like three gods, that Christians believe in three gods. This is, this is um, I don't know of one Christian in the world that believes that there are three gods. The manifestation of the Trinity is something that I think most Christian theologians and scholars would rightly recognize as something really complex. I mean, 
human life is complex. Why are we here? How does the universe exist as it, as it, as it does? These are all really large questions. And these large, difficult questions play out in how Christians think about God. Now, personally, uh, I do not believe the Trinity should be a requisite for Christian identity. I don't believe it should. But do I believe in the Trinity? Yes, I do. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus's um, spiritual essence. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. I've felt all of these things in my life. But this understanding that I just gave to you would not be the same understanding that other Christians have of the Trinity, right? So for Muslims out there, when they say, well, how do you believe in the Trinity? The better question is, how do you understand the Trinity? And then we can go from there. Do you see what I'm saying? So rather than just saying, a lot of times people force their views um, on the Trinity onto people like me without asking me, like, what do you think of that? You know, as a scholar too, like this whole last two summers, um, in addition to writing this book, I've been writing another book on Muhammad's interactions with Christians. And to understand these interactions, I've had to go into Christian history, the first 500 years of Christian history. How did Jesus become divine? Um, these are all things that played out in various councils over time. So that reminds us that even, you know, consensus across the Christian church on something like Jesus's divinity, there's not always been a consensus and there still isn't a consensus. So the best thing I think for people to do is to remember Christianity is not a monolith. The Trinity is not a monolith. Jesus isn't a monolith. And it's best to ask the individual person how they feel uh, or how they interpret these issues. Good question. I hope that answered it. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I think we can probably do uh, two more questions before we uh, leave this session. Uh, Catherine asks... Are there Islamic communities that live their ideas similar to the Christian-centered Amish and Mennonites? And actually linked to that, if I may, uh, Rana asks, which among the Christian denominations is closest to Islam in your opinion and, and why? Okay, so the first, let me do the first question. Um, yeah. So is there, let me make sure I get this right. Is there a Muslim community that kind of lives their life in accordance to like something similar to the Amish community? Amish and Mennonites. Uh, the, the, the author of the question says their ideals. So however you want to inter interpret that. Well, uh, so from I did hang out with a Mennonite um, community way back in 2008, actually in Texas before I lived here. And they lived a very simple life. Uh, it was very austere, um, hardworking people. They were pacifists. They did not believe in um, joining the military. And they used their, um, their constitutional right to um, avoid military service at all costs. Um, I imagine at least that particular community that I hung out with, they were big into their scripture. Um, so all of these kind of four or five features that I just laid out, I mean, certainly there are Muslim communities, um, perhaps even America, that, that live um, in this type of manner. Actually, you know what? There is an example. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say that this is the, an exact match, but there's a community in New York it's kind of upstate New York. It, it's referred to as Islamburg. I don't know if anyone's heard about that. There was actually an unfortunate um, hate crime incident. Uh, the FBI has been up there. And this is basically a, a Muslim community. It's largely African-American, I think. And they just live in the woods. And they, have, they run their own school. They're basically, um, you know, they live a, a simple life, um, self-sufficient. But they also have people that live in the village that go outside of the village that, you know, work regular jobs like a lot of Americans do. Uh, but they're kind of, they're isolated in a way because they want to they wanna live um, their own life. So I think actually that's a pretty good parallel. Now, um, Catherine, I would suggest you um, 
you look up Islamberg, but be careful because most of the news coverage is going to be around a lot of the, the coverage of Islamberg is like blatantly Islamophobic. You have these kind of evil forces in this country that like to say that Islamberg is like, you know, a, a jihad camp and like all this stuff, which has been, you know, uh, disproven by journalists, by police officers who say that the Islamberg community is, is great and so on and so forth. The second question is there a Christian community that, uh, can you repeat that one, Emre? Uh, which among the Christian denominations, denominations. is closest to Islam in your opinion and, and why? So I think the closest denomination or sect to Islam probably doesn't exist anymore. But if you go back into the first century and you look at two communities called the Ebionites, E-B-I-O-N-I-T-E-S, and the Nazarenes. These are two early communities that scholars refer to as Jewish Christian communities. And these communities essentially, and there's branches of these two communities, but basically they believe, they did not believe that Jesus was the son of God. Um, They did not believe he was divine. They believed he was a prophet, but they also believed that he was the Messiah. And the Ebionites and the Nazarenes are said to have um, also lived their life according to the Halakha, Jewish Jewish law provided by the Talmud. So, you know, they were eating, um, you know, they weren't drinking alcohol, uh, kosher, um, so on and so forth. I would say um, those two communities, I, I really don't think a lot of people living today would identify themselves as Ebionites in, in Nazarenes. Um, but if you go back into early Christian history, there were plenty of um, sects that really were quite um, tightly aligned to the Islamic tradition. And one thing that you know I've been researching a lot was whether the, the Christians that Muhammad was interacting with. So for, for example, um, Waraka ibn Nafal, when Muhammad had his revelations um, in the cave in Mount Hira in 610, and he heads down the mountain and he goes to Khadija, Khadija says, I, I want to bring you to my uncle, who is a Christian, uh, Waraka ibn Nafal. And Muhammad goes there and, and ibn Nafal basically says, oh, you're the, you're the prophet like, like Moses, and you're going to kind of fulfill the law. A lot of people, uh, scholars, speculate that he may have been an Ebionite. He may have been one of these these heret- heret- heretical Christian groups that were pushed away from Constantinople uh, in the Byzantine Empire, and they ended up in the Arabian Desert to live their their, their heretical life in, in isolation. But these are really spe- this is all speculation. I mean, it's very very difficult to to prove that these specific Christian communities um, ex- we know they existed, but whether there were Christians practicing these religions at the time of Muhammad's life. It's really hard to, it's hard to prove that. If there are any Ebionites or Nazarenes in the world, I would love to meet them. If you know any, um, put me in touch. Look up Craig. <laughs> oh, very good. Now, Craig, we're coming up on, on an hour. Uh, just a reminder, we've shared the links to Craig's book. We've shared links to our sh- social media. Uh, if you're here visiting the, our channel, please, again, subscribe, give, give this uh, video a thumbs up. And uh, for those people that weren't able to catch this live, please uh, share this with your, your friends and, and your network. Uh, so that's all the plugging we can do regarding both us and, uh, and Craig's book. But uh, I've got a comment. Somebody's actually asked uh, about women's rights, and because that's in the book, and that's a huge topic, I think it's uh, Kuaiba. Uh, please, uh, of course, uh, get to the book. I think it's chapter five. Yes. Uh, so that's yeah. one thing. Uh, unfortunately, we we won't be able to delve into beyond some of the things you did you did say. But I'm going to end on this. Unless there's something else you want to add before we wrap up, Craig. Just, maybe tell us a little bit about your any current projects. You mentioned the another book you're working on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the next book, which I'm going to submit the first draft, uh, August 31st. Uh, August 31st. Excuse me. Um, tentatively titled the the dialogue of civilizations muhammad's interactions with christians it might end up being the the synthesis of civilizations muhammad's interactions with christians not sure but 
basically it's a biography of Muhammad's life told through his interactions with Christians. And, you know, I've really done a ridiculous amount of research, really um, digging and digging for information that is not really readily available. And a lot of it is based in legends and, and tales and, you know, how do we decipher a kind of fact from fiction? Um, so this book will be out in, you know, God willing, in 2021, next year. And it'll be um, published by Hearst uh, and, and hopefully Oxford, Oxford University Press. So that's my goal. And then one last thing I'll say with the, the women's rights thing. Yeah, definitely check out the, the chapter in the book. Um, I'll just say this, like Muhammad was, he would be considered today as progressive, in terms of women's rights, there's there's no question um, about it. For what he was what he was signifying and what he was calling for in the the seventh century was, in terms of women's rights, was essentially revolutionary, and it was one of the reasons um, why he faced so much backlash. It's because he was he was treating women with with dignity and respect, and people didn't like that. So he was progressive. I'll say that, and I say that in the book. Okay. Okay. Again, this is the uh, the book. One last look at it. Uh, you've got all the links. I'm going to end on a comment from one of the participants, Craig, if, if, if you don't mind. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I think we had uh, somewhat of uh, about 120 or so participants. Uh, so thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Uh, subscribe to our newsletters to find out more about our our future events. And of course, if you are hanging around our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see what we've done previously regarding, for example, religious freedom in uh, corporate America, one of our recent uh, events. So uh, uh, stay around beyond this event to uh, see uh, what else we've been working on. But this is a comment from Mete, and I'll end on this. And he says, I really liked your point on focusing to the universal message of Jesus and Muhammad instead of theological arguments on divinity related issues all the best from australia so uh, on that uh, on that point thank you thank you for your, your focus uh craig uh, godspeed to you and your good work uh both in the social sphere i know you're very active uh, we should give a plug to uh uh to craig's uh twitter and instagram uh just look up uh craig's name no doubt you'll find him he's got i think 150,000 close to 200,000 uh, followers, so you'll be able to stay in tune with what Craig's thinking and, and, and saying uh, beyond this event and really beyond the pages of the book. Uh, but of, of course, I can't endorse the book uh, enough. We look forward to hosting Craig on future occasions, and of course, we look forward to hosting uh, the participants that, uh, that are watching this through our YouTube channel. Uh, again, thank you, Craig, for taking the time. Uh, I wish you well in your future research endeavors. Thank and thank you, you to everyone else. And let me also say, I'm ready. Thank you for being a wonderful host, my friend. And I'm seeing messages here on my phone saying, this guy's a great host. So thank you so much. And I owe you a meal. So next time, you know, God willing soon, we'll, we'll, yes. we can all travel I, and I can, uh, we can, we, we can break bread in, in Texas at a nice Italian restaurant. I, I've uh, I found a nice Hillel uh, Texas root place, so uh, we can very do that. good. We'll do that for sure. God yes. willing. Thank you thank so you, much. You. Maybe that was my mom texting you, by the way. <laughs> it was actually my dad. <laughs> oh, there you go. Say hi okay. to him. I will. Thank you all okay, so everyone. much. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Until next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.